The Consulting Success Podcast is powered by the Clarity Coaching Program. If you'd like to work directly with the Consulting Success team and receive personal coaching and support to optimize and grow your consulting business, marketing, and revenue, visit consultingsuccess.com to find out more and apply. Welcome to the Consulting Success Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Zapersky. In this podcast, we'll dive deep into the world of elite consultants, where you'll learn the strategies, tactics, and mindset to grow a highly profitable and successful consulting business. Hey, everyone. It's Michael Zapersky, and today I'm here with Constance Dierks. Constance, welcome. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to join you. Yeah, I really enjoyed our conversation even before we hit record. So I think this is going to be a good one. You've worked with and advised you know, I think over 500 executives on six continents mm-hmm. and in 20 industries. Your clients include very well-known organizations like AT&T, IBM, yeah. Olive Garden, many, many more. Mm-hmm. You're also an author, speaker, a frequent contributor to publications that we've probably all heard, Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and others. Yes. So you've accomplished a lot, and I'm excited to, to dive into kind of how you got to where you are today and extract some of those lessons and best practices and insights for everyone listening. But let's kind of start off earlier uh, mm-hmm. in your, your lifetime, which is your education. You have both a master's and a PhD in psychology. I do. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Like, how has that, if at all, helped you to become a successful consultant? Oh my gosh. It's been enormously influential. And I think part of the reason is, is that I finished my education when I was officially a grown-up. So I was a college dropout, got married, had children, and then later was working as a stockbroker. Now, it may surprise your listeners to realize that you can be a stockbroker without a bachelor's degree, but I did it. Maybe they might not allow that anymore. And while I was a broker, I kept observing the really irrational ways in which people made decisions about their money, because that's what I was talking to them about was their money. But I realized all the influences on them that affected their decisions. And sometimes in ways that were really pretty far away from their self-interest. And, you know, lest you think that it's only clients who have this problem, I noticed that my colleagues weren't exactly a lot better than clients. So I started studying and reading on my own decision science. And then I would go and run into the psychology department and read books on cognition and perception and how emotion affects decisions. And I was running back and forth and running back. I was like, why doesn't somebody put these together? This is ridiculous. And at the time, I didn't know about a very marvelous researcher named Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize in economics and who is a psychologist. And so I decided to go back to school and figure out how I could help people make better decisions, decisions that would lead to more success and more happiness. I had to choose at that point. So I chose psychology because I felt like it encompassed more than if I went through business. So I got a PhD in clinical psychology. I clocked about 4,000 clinical hours, graduated, and became a consultant. (laughs) Haven't seen a therapy patient in over 20 years. I want to explore that with you. But before we do, why did you drop out of college? Because I wanted to get married and have babies. Okay. Yeah, I was very young. I mean, I wish I had a more sophisticated answer to that question. Yeah, no, no. It's so you going back to to university, you were, I'm guessing, older than a lot of other students. Yeah. Or I was, and that terrified me. Yeah, what was that like? I mean, for some people, that would be enough to prevent them from going back, feeling like an outsider or maybe you don't fit in or something wrong with you. Like what was going through your mind and how did you actually you know, get yourself to go. You make a great point, And I'm glad you did because so many people let something like their age stop them. I was in my early 30s when I did that. And what enabled me to do it were two things. One was my husband who encouraged me to go and do what I wanted to do. He's my second husband. We'd been married two years I used to come home at night and just be so upset and talk about how I hated my job as a stockbroker. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I told him and he said, well, then you should do it. So I had support, which is so, so, so important. And I just felt very like I was on some kind of a mission. Like my mission was, I got to help people stop making such stupid decisions. 
because I saw even really smart people and some people with a lot of money and a lot of professional success. So I felt really driven by a purpose. But here's the cool thing I discovered is that there are so many universities all around Canada and the U.S. where the average age of the student body is not 20. It's not 21. The average age of students where I went, University of North Carolina in Asheville, was 28. And so I was like this much older, and I don't think anybody noticed. I think I cared a lot more than they did. The night I graduated with my bachelor's degree, there was a woman in my class who graduated with a degree in psychology. She was 63 years old. And I was like, everybody was thrilled for her. That's a good example of how perception affects decisions. And that perception can be wildly misguided. But yeah. people need support. So if anybody in your life wants to go back to school, my advice is support them, encourage them to do it. It's so true. You know, I wrote in my book, The Elite Consulting Mind, that like the grass is always greener, right? So people will say to themselves, oh, I'm too young to do this, right. or I'm too old to do this, right. or I live in a small town, so I don't have you know, access to these things, or I live in a big city, and so it's too competitive. Like Our minds are always trying to play tricks on us and get us to you know, create reasons or excuses for why we shouldn't do something. But back to, yes. to you, Constance, you were thinking here, you know, you're a little bit older, you found a place where you weren't that much older. But I'm guessing, or it sounds like maybe there was still some resistance inside of you, even though you had a husband that was very supportive. Mm -hmm. Have you learned maybe from that time or just even through your studies around psychology, when you encounter a situation that is challenging, mm -hmm. where maybe your mind is telling you, no, don't go forward with this, don't make a fool of yourself, <laughs> yeah. all these different you know, negative things could, could happen, yeah. right? Like your mind is playing these, these games yeah. on you. What do you do? What have you found that is helpful for you to maybe acknowledge that, but still take action and move forward? Yeah. I want to back up for a second though and say it's not really our minds playing tricks on us. It's our minds trying to rationalize our emotion. Mm. So you have the emotion, but it's emotions are often ambiguous and unformed, especially around things like what we're talking about. And so the way we try to make sense of our experience, which is often felt in our body or our guts, you know, people will say, oh, my guts are churning. And so the mind rationalizes and says, well, you're feeling this way because, you know, you haven't done this before and you're too young, you're too old, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too thin, you're too fat, whatever. You know, I was called too blonde at one point, like, you know, whatever. I mean, I'm of descent where people are fair haired and blue eyed and have light skin. I mean, you know, what am I going to do about that? So what I learned was that oftentimes the rumination was a lot worse than the action. Mm. I've also learned as I've gotten older that failure is not fatal. Like, what if I went up on a stage and did something ridiculous? And nobody's armed. Well, we hope nobody's <laughs> armed in the audience. And then I've also studied courage and I've learned that we don't go from being scared to being wildly courageous like this. But you take these steps, and if you mine your experience for success, and you say, okay, well, I, I walked into Merrill Lynch without an undergraduate degree and got hired as a broker, passed the Series 7, the blah, all these tests, and let yourself recognize that you did that, then you start to build up. It's almost like building muscle. You know, you lift weights but you don't get a big bicep the next day. Yeah. So I've learned that courage can be learned and strengthened. I think that's such an important point. Too often, I think people are focused on the future without taking a moment to acknowledge what they've already achieved. Yes. And then it's your only, you're, like, you're looking into the unknown. So of course you might feel some hesitation, but if you actually look at what you've already conquered in your life and what you've overcome, that's a sign that you know, you've done it, you can do it again. Do you have that? Like, yes. were there many women stockbrokers when you were a stockbroker? No. So how did you get involved in that? Do you just love, love I mean, money or what was, what was going on? <laughs> I like to look at organizations through a strategic financial lens. I'm not an accountant, so I don't dig in to numbers deeply, but I like to understand where a company's investing their money and you know, how well it's doing and how the decisions are made. I was actually selling computers and 
at the time I was selling computers, microcomputers were a fairly new thing. And IBM entered the market and destroyed, just destroyed the retail microcomputer business. And so I was selling more and earning less. Now that you asked me this, I'm remembering. I went to the library to study careers. Like, what kind of a job can I get without a degree where I can make enough money to support myself and my daughters? Because I was single at the time. And I found out that stockbrokers in the U.S. on average made $90,000 a year. And that sounded pretty good. You're reminding me of how calculated I was. I knew that I didn't really speak the lingo. So I made a list of all the brokerage firms in my area. And I ranked them by where I would ideally want to work. And Merrill Lynch was at the top. So I got hired by Merrill Lynch. But I started out by approaching the ones down here on my list and failing miserably, like none of them hired me. Not only that, one guy said to me, not only will I not hire you, neither will anyone else. So that really ticked me off. Right, when you said that ticked you off, did that encourage you to take more yes. action and prove him wrong yes. or it did? Yes. And so it ticked me off so much, Mr. E.F. Hutton. I wish I could remember his name because I'd say it right here and now. I launched myself out of his office. I literally like threw the door open. I walked two blocks up the street to the Merrill Lynch office, walked in. I knew one person there and I asked to see him. And he said, oh, what are you doing here? And I said, well, you know, your competition's trying to hire me. So I thought we should talk. (laughs) That is brassy, right? That is really... But you know what? I figured, what have I got to lose? I've already been turned down by the people I don't admire and don't want to work with. So yeah, I love it. I got interviewed and they asked me where I went to school. And I said, UNC Asheville, which was true, but they didn't ask me if I graduated. They never asked for a transcript. They just assumed I had a college education. And one of the things that taught me is that language skills are critical. If you have a good vocabulary and facility with language, it can take you really far. And I I don't mean lie or fake things, but having the ability to focus on developing your language skills and then execute on that is really helpful. And luckily, I'd had some good experiences in that regard. So, you know, all you English majors out there, you have not wasted your time. Yeah. What's one thing if, you know, looking back, if someone said, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I'd like to improve my language skills. What's one piece of advice that you would offer that you think might be easy or at least they could take action on and see a a result rather quickly? Read. Fiction, nonfiction. While we work with a lot of seasoned and experienced consultants here at Consulting Success, I'm often contacted by new early stage consultants. Invariably, the question I'm asked is, what are the steps I should take to become a successful consultant and grow my consulting business to my first six figures per year? Well, I'm excited to announce that we've opened the doors for our Momentum program. This is our most popular program for early stage consultants, and it has helped almost 1,000 consultants to start, run, and grow successful consulting businesses. It gives you the step-by-step plan to help you with your messaging, your fees, and pricing strategies, how to win more proposals, how to go to market more effectively, developing a marketing system to generate leads consistently, and so much more. And right now, until September the 19th, you can sign up for Momentum and get 50% off the regular price by going to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio, A-U-D-I-O. Only 100 spots are available to join Momentum and get 50% off. This deal is only available until September the 19th or until all 100 spots are gone. We won't be opening up new spots in this program for several months. So don't wait. Go to consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. That's consultingsuccess.com forward slash audio. A-U-D-I-O. Anything, read anything, read everything. And when you come to a word you don't know, look it up and then go online. So we have such an advantage now. You can go online and you can hear the word pronounced. Because one of the things that trips people up is when they try to use big multisyllabic words, but they mispronounce them or they use it in a way that's not exactly right, which actually 
unfortunately makes them look worse. I mean, common ordinary language is fine, but you know, just have mastery over and then be on a mission to build your vocabulary consistently. I look up words probably, I don't know, more days than not, I'm looking up a word or a concept. Yeah, nice. So let's now kind of shift to your consulting business. Yeah. You, you left the stockbroker world, yeah. right? And went into studying psychology, you got your PhD, your master's in that area. You logged a whole bunch of clinical hours yeah. <laughs> in psychology, right? Yeah. You started your consulting firm, CD Consulting Group, which stands for your name, right? CD. Yeah. <laughs> in, no imagination. Believe around. <laughs> yeah, it works, right? And actually, that's an important point. It just goes to show that you don't have to have like the world's most brilliant, new, innovative name to be successful, right? You're right about that. Yeah. Because people know when you're a solo entrepreneur, people know you by your name and your face and what you, you know, produce. So some schmancy, and I got good advice about that from my mentor, Alan Weiss. He said, you know, don't spend your energy on that and on a logo. Just go get clients. I will say though, when I got out of grad school, I went to work for a firm. So I was with a consulting firm for 12 years and I was a partner. And I knew that I would leave when I felt like I wasn't learning anything. Yeah. And I reached a point where I, you know, rightly or wrongly, I'm not criticizing them. I didn't feel like I was learning. So I left. That's been almost 11 years. Hey, it's Michael here. And we'll be right back to the podcast. But first, Are you ready to grow, scale, and take your consulting business and marketing to the next level? If so, our Clarity Coaching Program may be a great fit for you. You'll work with our experienced team to set up a strategic plan for your business and coach you step-by-step in areas like how to consistently attract more leads, develop a magnetic message that resonates with your ideal clients, strategically package and position your services, earn higher fees, win more proposals, and scale your business. To find out more about Clarity Coaching and apply, go to consultingsuccess.com and click on Coaching. Tell us a little bit more about like that. When you started CD Consulting Group around 2010, like what really sparked that decision? Why did you decide to kind of go out and, and start your own consulting firm? One of the things that consulting firms do that I think is a big mistake is they focus on methodology. Mm-hmm. So they have phrases they use that I think are irrelevant and get in the way of delivering value. You know, we're going to do a pitch. We're going to you know, go to this meeting and we've got our deck and we stand up and we say, we've been in business for 87,000 years. Like, guess what, folks? No one cares. Mm. They don't care. And I see consultants focusing on telling clients how they do things and all the features. I have never done that since I met Alan Weiss, who I mentioned a moment ago, because Alan's whole focus is on delivering value. And I felt like the firm I was with was a good firm, but traditional and was too wedded to their own history, which was long and their own methodology. And I wanted to be free to just sit with a CEO or a senior executive, listen to them, come to some agreement about what needed to be done to move them further faster and then do that. And even if it meant I had to create a way to do it, I was going to do it. And so I've invented sort of very bespoke methodologies, but they're not weighty. They're very simple. They're always very simple. So once you made that decision to go on your own, what was the first thing that you did you know, to get your own client to build your business? I told everybody what I was doing. So who specifically, like just kind of run us through, was it family, friends? Everybody I knew. Like, just everyone. <laughs> And how did you do it? This is family. (laughs) Did you call them? Did you email them? Did you send them letters in the mail? What did you do to actually let them know? I'm mostly trying to think back. I used email a lot and I called people. I have to say, luck for me, it's played a role in most parts of my life that have gone well. And the lucky thing was that after I left the firm, a former client of the firms who we hadn't worked with in several years, which meant I was not violating my non-compete, called me up. And I thought this woman didn't even like, I hadn't talked to her in like, I don't know, three or four years. And she said, I need your help. And I ended up doing a ton of business with her company on and off for probably eight years. I mean, probably several million dollars worth of consulting. Got you. And why did she call you? 
because she remembered me being very good and very facile in situations where it was very high stakes. And she used the phrase high stakes, by the way, which I stole and said, oh, I'm going to say that about myself now. Because I asked her, why me? And she said, you're quick, you're smart, and you're very direct. You know, you will tell a CEO if you think that he or she is misguided, but you'll do it in a way that you're not insulting them. They understand and they trust that you are trying to help them achieve their objectives, not yours. It was lovely. So the spigot got turned on and I ended up having a successful, like my first three years were pretty good. It allowed me to stop being terrified. (laughs) And was most of your business with that one client for a long period of time? So, okay. So you had that one client, right? You you mentioned, but I think it probably came about through something more than luck. You were, you obviously did a great job previously and, you know, they remembered that, but. Yeah. Well, good work helps. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And how did you get the next few clients? What actions do you take and, and where did that come from? I did a little bit of contract work for my former employer. Yeah. But that helped financially. That didn't really help with my business growth over the long haul because of the non-compete. You know, that just extended my non-compete, but it let me be less terrified. I think when I really started to grow my business was when I got more brave about telling people what I did. Because when people meet you in a given circumstance, that defines your brand for them. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, you're an executive coach. It just made me want to like stab them with a pen or something. Like, so I started looking for opportunities in normal conversations with people to drop in some of my experience, like in M&A, for example. And then I started doing things like having a lot of lunches and coffees with people. But what I was doing, this is really important, lunches and coffees and dinners or whatever, a glass of wine is fine. But if you're not looking for the buyer and you're not looking for a need that you can help with or that you could refer them to someone, which you'll get credit for that, not money, but credit. And so I got very good at listening. So for example, if I went to lunch with someone and they said, oh, our company needs you, our CEO needs your help, doesn't make them a buyer, right? So buyer in my language is someone who has the responsibility for achieving a result and has the authority to hire me without getting permission from anyone. Who, by the way, can sign the check and pay me in advance. Definitely. And let's say you're in that situation, right? You're having a coffee or lunch or whatever with someone and they say, yeah, like based on what you just shared, Constance, I could really see how our CEO could benefit from, you know, from your help. So they're not the buyer. So what do you then do? What have you found works best to then get in front of the buyer? I asked to be introduced. And what if they say, well, no, typically our CEO likes me to kind of vet through things and get some information. Can you send me some more information first? No. Why not? <laughs> because the, the person who can... I can have the conversation with about their objectives is the person who owns responsibility for achieving the objective. Yeah. And so what I would say to that person, I wouldn't be so blunt. I wouldn't be like, no, (laughs) I would say, you know, it's really not fair to you to expect you to do my marketing for me. Mm -hmm. And we could talk for hours, but inevitably in my experience, you're Mr. Big will have questions that only I can answer. So why don't we figure out what the best way is to get me in front of him? And perhaps you and I should talk with him together. But sometimes what Mr. Big needs or wants is a little bit of privacy. And I'll tell you what, if I get a meeting with him, I will come back to you and we'll have a discussion about the themes of that discussion. How's that? And you found that that works really well. I don't let people give me the runaround because they're not the buyer and they're reluctant to introduce me. Or sometimes when I was a baby consultant, a mistake I made was thinking or not recognizing that that person didn't have the stature inside the company Mm -hmm. to make the introduction and that they were too embarrassed to say that, or maybe they didn't know it. So they would obfuscate and it's like, well, like just what you said oh, well, we need to talk some more and I need to gather the information and then I'll take it. No. Has that ever worked for you? Really? Has it worked for you? 
I was hoping that you would say what you said, because I think this is <laughs> a challenge that many people come up against, right? It's, it's like the idea of focus and specialization and getting very clear on where you can truly add value, right? A lot of people just say, oh, I help all kinds of businesses and they have no idea you know, where to target kind of their energy and their focus right? because they're worried about losing opportunities, right? Every, they kind of think everyone's equal. And the same thing with the situation that we just kind of role played very lightly together, right? A lot of people would be in that situation and go, well, yeah, I, mean, I should probably still have that conversation because I don't want to miss this opportunity. And then they end up just wasting a lot of time, unfortunately. That's right. Talking to a non-buyer. So I, I think what you shared is, is really, really valuable. Yeah. And I appreciate you kind of working through that role play with me because I think a lot of people will get some guidance on that. Well, they get flummoxed. And part of the reason is, and I, I actually said this to a client not too long ago. She's a very smart, talented executive. She's got a big job, big title, but it's less than what she could be doing. And I said to her, you are playing not to lose. You are not playing to win. Mm. And she was like, you know, like, oh my God, you know, you're right. And of course, the point isn't for me to be right. The point is for her to be brave enough to go after what she can do. Yeah. And what she can do is more than what she's doing now. And she's getting sort of micromanaged at her level, which is kind of ridiculous. In your experience, how important is it to be direct with clients, even when you might fear that you're going to put them off or that you're going to say something that kind of goes against the grain or what they believe? In your experience, how critical is that to your success of being very direct? It's very important to my success. However, I will say that it's foolish to be direct and very affirmative if you don't have enough information. And what I see people do that's a mistake is they talk to somebody in an organization and they go, and the person takes that as the truth. And the truth is usually more of an amalgamation of information. And so once I feel like I have enough information that my point of view is valid, then I become very brave. And I'll say something to a client, which I rarely say this, but sometimes I say, ignore me at your peril. And I only say that to clients where we have a, you know, we know each other well, and we have a good relationship because they know I don't talk like that all the time. And it's my way of going, you know, warning Will Robinson, right. you're about to make a mistake. And sometimes they make the decision anyway mm. that I've advised them not to make. When it goes wrong, I never say, I told you so. They usually remember. As a solo independent consultant, how have you approached and kind of what's your mindset around growth, right? You only have so many hours in a day. There's a capacity kind of level that once you reach, right, you can't go beyond. So what have you found has been really beneficial or helpful for you in being able to achieve your growth goals and, and continue to build a business, even though it's, it's you? Well, first of all, I don't charge for my time. Never have. I don't work that way. Yep. I had a client in the past and we knew each other well. And he said, well, but you've got to figure out how long this is going to take. And I'm like, no, I, I'm not. And he goes, but somewhere in your formula, there has to be time. And I'm like, there isn't. And he finally relented. So I base my fees on the value that my client is going to derive. And my fee is a percentage of that that represents as best my client and I can figure together my contribution to their success. So in M&A, for example, it might be, you know, a half a percent of a price that some company is paying for some other company or a quarter of a percent. And I mean, I don't even get it down to like, I don't necessarily do the detailed math on it. But once your buyer articulates with your good guiding, supportive questioning, what it would mean to them to achieve their objectives financially and also personally, what's the order, the intangibles. Once they articulate that and you give that back to them with how you're going to help and what it's worth, your fee should be a non-issue. And if your fee is an issue, something that happened before then is wrong. Money's never really the reason people say no. That's what they tell you. Money is more of a priority. Like 
organizations have money. People say, well, I consult to not-for-profits. That's why I don't have a good business. That's horse pucky. You know, am I allowed to say that? (laughs) Southern word. I'm not too familiar with that. (laughs) So one question, you know, when we talk about value pricing and kind of ROI in, in terms of fees, when do you personally say to yourself, okay, let's say that, you know, this is going to be a hundred million dollar deal, or I'm going to help to create $10 million in in value. And so, yes, you know, I could look at 20% of that or, you know, a three or four times return on investment for the client. At what point do you look at the fee and go, yeah, I I can't just because I'm going to be spending some time with them and I'm going to help them to achieve $10 million in growth over the next 12 months, even a 10 times return on investment, right? That's that's a million dollars. Like at what level do you go, well, yeah, maybe I shouldn't charge like that much. Like, yeah. How do you think about that in terms of making sure that you still receive equitable and fair and great compensation while at the same time, not just casting a, a large you know, number that might actually be beyond where you should be? How, just kind of what's your thought process around that? Yeah, I think there's such a thing as an indefensible, ridiculous fee I don't know. I don't know how to explain how I do that, but I definitely do exactly what you're saying where I say, oh, that's... And oftentimes what happens, especially talking about M&A, is that I start doing work that's described this, you know, this is the work. And then, you know, nine or 10 months later, then we see something else and then there's something. So it might add up to five or six or $700,000, but it not, isn't necessarily agreed to all at once up front. Because as we go, as you go through a deal, you learn more. And so you make adjustments. And I've learned that what I thought I should be doing at one point in time can definitely change. And those conversations with your client are priceless because it shows them that your interest is their interest. Yeah. You know, and you're not just jumping on some bandwagon. Constance, there's, there's so much more that we could be going into here. What I want to do is make sure that people can learn more about you or your work. So where's the best place for them to, to learn more about you? My website, which is my name, which, you know, that sounds simple enough, right? Except my last name is Belgian. It has an X on the end of it. Yeah. But We'll have that linked up in the, in the show notes. Yeah, we're going to have it all in the show notes. So Constance, yeah, Derek, it's, yeah, the spelling, everyone, it's D-I-E-R-I-C-K-X. But we'll have a link if you want to go to our website directly. We'll have it all linked up. And yeah. I just want to thank you again so much for coming on here and just spending some time sharing a little bit into you know, your, your backstory, how you got to where you are and how you've achieved you know, success. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been really fun. You ask good questions. And I appreciate that. You know, they're not the usual. We try our best. That's all I can say. (laughs) So thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Consulting Success Podcast. For more episodes and to subscribe, rate, and leave a review, head on over to iTunes. And if you'd like to develop consistent lead flow and a highly profitable consulting business, learn more about our coaching programs at consultingsuccess.com. 